Uh, I am, uh, as you say, primarily a pig producer, and some people who know my background ask me why on earth I'm a pig producer. And uh, by the end of this presentation, perhaps some of you will ask me why on earth I'm still a pig producer. Uh, I have two answers to that question. Uh, the serious one is, uh, and I hope you'll forgive a little English understatement here, I think making stuff is quite important and quite worthwhile. And if you're going to make stuff, I think making food is quite important and quite worthwhile. Uh, the facetious answer to why I'm still a pig producer is that I can't bear the thought of stopping being a pig producer and then watching my peers make a million dollars next year. <laughs> You'll notice uh, up in the top left corner of all my slides, it says BPEX, that logo there. BPEX is the, is the English equivalent of the uh, National Port Board. Uh, and I'd like to express my gratitude for them helping bring me over here. So BPEX is the, uh, the levy or checkoff board for pigs covering England. Uh, it in turn is part of AHDB, you'll see down in the bottom right corner of the screen, AHDB, the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board, is the collective umbrella organization for levy boards in uh, the UK covering uh, pork, beef and lamb, dairy, arable crops, potatoes, and horticulture. Uh, it doesn't cover poultry, eggs, and it doesn't cover Christmas trees either. This is what I propose to uh, cover in my talk. Um, I think the interesting point I want to draw out here is that I'm going to cover legislation and activism, but, uh, and market their change and industry adaptation, but the lines between those get quite blurred and are becoming increasingly blurred as time goes on. And as we see change happening in Europe, it's quite difficult to know quite which is the force uh, which, is, which is trumping all the others and bringing about that change. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say, unfortunately, is negative, uh, just explaining some negative experiences, but it's not all negative. So if you're feeling depressed as I go through some of the things I'm describing, there is some good news uh, in amongst what I have to say. It took me a while to find it. But, uh, <laughs> I've got it. This is the bit I like best about my presentation, uh, talking a little bit about me. Uh, in the interest of getting through on time and getting through to a break, I'll make it as brief as possible. But I am here for the rest of the day and uh, tomorrow morning. So if any of you would like to approach me and talk about me a little more, uh, I'd be very happy, very happy to, uh, to indulge you. Um, this is a picture of my uh, gestating sow barn uh, topic at the moment. Uh, we don't have close confinement stalls in the UK anymore, and we haven't done since uh, 1999. On my farm, actually, we've been without those stores since 1990. The legislation in the UK was introduced in 1989 with a 10-year lead-in uh, period. Uh, as it happens on my farm, we needed new sour accommodation anyway in 1990, so we were able to avoid the pain of junking an existing system and, uh, and build our system from scratch uh, as we wanted to. Uh, the only problem in 1990 was the, that no one knew how to do it. Anyone who had housed their sows uh, in groups uh, had, uh, was either dead or had forgotten how to do it. Um, and so we made it up as we went along. Uh, I'm not saying we got everything right, and I'm not saying that our example uh, would work anywhere else uh, other than in the UK with our particular climate and uh, traditions. But the, the key points I would draw, bring out of it. Um, first of all, you can see that yellow stuff on the floor in those buildings. That's straw. Uh, most of, most uh, American producers, in fact, most producers around the world wouldn't dream of using straw in their, in, their, in their pig farms, but we use a lot of it. Our system uses 600 kilos of straw per sow per year, which is an awful lot of straw. We also give them an awful lot of space. Uh, might frighten you if any of you are pig producers. We give 40 square feet per sow. Um, and I don't know quite what is the right number, but what I would urge any pig producers considering building a sow barn now is, for goodness sake, don't scrimp on space. If you try and cut the space to the absolute minimum, you will have problems, that you, and you will regret doing so later on. So give them space. It means a lot of labor, 
I have six full-time staff looking after 500 sales power to finish. And uh, yeah, that's six full-time staff looking after 500 sales. That's an awful lot of staff. However, it's very low maintenance cost. That building was built in 1990, haven't replaced anything yet, apart from a few drinkers. Haven't replaced anything. All the steel work is just fine. All the block work is just fine. Uh, everything works as it should. Big issue, uh, of course, uh, in the UK and uh, for you coming up and elsewhere in the world is uh, the cost of transition in going from one system to the next. But what I would say to you is that is the issue, the cost of transition and planning, getting permission uh, to build the buildings. But don't kid yourselves. There's nothing wrong with housing, housing groups. It works beautifully. It works beautifully, and I, for one, would never go back. Um, the UK, uh, some of what I say later will uh, lead you to conclude that maybe we are, uh, in the UK, maybe we are like the emperor with no clothes, um, who hasn't yet realized he hasn't got any clothes on. But we do take, we do take a lot of pride in, in the UK for uh, our history of looking at, of care for animals, whether that's through, by, whether that's through choice or by legislation. Um, but we do take a lot of care, and we have got a long history doing it. Uh, the, the RSPCA, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, has been in existence a long time. And the interesting point about the RSPCA is, it's a, although it's a charity, it is a quasi-official uh, body. Um, it carries an awful lot of weight with consumers. It is widely respected as, as the official voice uh, for animal welfare. And it does have uh, the ability to prosecute. So if anybody is, is uh, charged with animal cruelty, it's the RSPCA which will bring those charges. Um, you're interesting, I say most recently, uh, I know in the UK we, <laughs> what happened 10, 20 years ago is pretty recent for us, uh, where it, perhaps it isn't for you guys, but most, the most recent piece of animal welfare legislation in the UK affecting the pig industry was the ban on uh, Jet close confinement gestation stores in 1999. There hasn't been any since. And that is largely because uh, even the UK government realized quite how stupid that piece of legislation was. Um, it was unilateral legislation within the UK. And the big problem with that is that the UK is, uh, as you know, part of the EU, which is a single market. And one of the features of a single market is you're not allowed to promote your national product at the expense of any products from the rest of the EU. In other words, uh, close confinement gestation stores were banned in the UK. They were allowed in the rest of the EU. We weren't allowed to tell anybody. The product wasn't differentiated on the shelf. And so, of course, where our industry crashed and burned, which is exactly what we said would happen, and it did. The 1997 index to the 100 is the sow herd in the UK by uh, Eight, ten years later, eight years later, it had halved. That's, that's the number of sows. It had halved. And uh, it's true that there were some really terrible market conditions around in 97, 1999, as I know you experienced here also. Um, but uh, our industry really, really dived as a result of this legislation. And just to prove that, the blue line is what happened in the EU as a whole. So the sow herd did decline over that 10-year period, uh, partly as a result of market conditions in 98, partly as a result of increasing productivity, uh, but we in the UK suffered really badly. And that's where they went. The green line is Denmark, and their herd increased uh, counter to the rest of the EU. There were other countries as well which increased their sow herd, but an awful lot of the sows went to Denmark. So, well done, guys. South stores were banned in the UK, the sales moved to Denmark and lived in South stores. So absolutely nothing was achieved from the point of view of animal welfare. Uh, a cautionary tale. Things have moved on. Um, and the EU, it's, it's, it's popular in the UK to blame the EU for most things. Um, but it is true, one, one thing that slipped by it slipped by us in the, the Treaty of Lisbon in, of, uh, a couple of years ago. And I should tell you that the, the major EU treaties are really, really 
fundamental parts of the whole basis of the EU. If something gets written in, one of the, in an EU treaty, then it is the truth. And it will be the truth until, uh, at the very earliest, the next treaty comes along, and they don't come along very often. Well, the Treaty of Lisbon recognized animals as uh, sentient beings. That's, that's what's written in the text. Animals are sentient beings. Well, that's okay. I can live with that. That means animals can feel things. Okay, I can live with that too. That means animals have feelings. And this is where it starts to get a little, a little tricky, but this is, this is what's been seized upon by a lot of the activist groups. Animals have feelings. Animals are the same as us. And uh, that brings us on to extraordinarily difficult ground. And it's very, very difficult because it's wrapped up in law. Uh, as a result, we have a wide range of animal activist groups in Europe. You have a lot of them operating over here too. You have some of your own, which you can keep. <laughs> and we have some others which haven't yet come your way, but may well do soon. And a lot of them have the agenda. That is their agenda to eliminate animal agriculture. And uh, most of them are quite open about that. Most of them are quite openly vegan organizations, and they say that's what they want to achieve. This is what's currently going on in Europe. Um, so uh, tethering of gestating sows has already been banned for the last six years. And uh, from January 2013, close confinement stores are banned across the whole of the EU, with the exception of the first four weeks of pregnancy. And that's what's coming up. But interestingly, what's happened this year, January 2012, was conventional cages for laying hens. The, the ban on, on, on those cages came in, into place. Uh, enriched cages are allowed, but the conventional cages are banned. This had a 10-year lead in time. Or no, actually, I think it was 12-year. A 12-year lead in time for this legislation. So everybody knows, has known it's been coming. Uh, however, it would appear that the market wasn't ready. That's what's happened to the wholesale price of eggs since January 2012. Although I'm sure there are some egg producers in, in the room who maybe have got really excited by that and the thought of uh, your egg price leaping up by 60% in the space of a month uh, uh, is, is, is quite dramatic. You can see that prices, you can argue that prices were perhaps rising through the whole of 2011 in anticipation of the, ba of, uh, of the ban on caged eggs. But the market really went crazy, really went crazy, and it's still crazy. You can see it's peaked and it's coming down, but nobody really knows where it's going to come down to. So what has happened is you really do have a two-tier market within the EU for eggs. What seems to be happening is that countries which aren't compliant, where there's a large proportion of eggs still being produced in conventional cages, uh, the, the, if you like, the... Uh, I can't think of a better word. The gentleman's agreement within the EU is that those eggs will be consumed in the country of production. In other words, they won't be traded even between member states within the EU. Um, and that's what seems to be happening. This, this is the price of compliant eggs that has shot up 60%. Um, I was talking to... I managed to ask the question of the farming director of one of the major retailers in the UK. I, was saying how you, I asked him, how are you getting on excluding non-compliant eggs from your products? And he said, we're doing really well. Uh, all our eggs, all our shell eggs, all our bakery products, uh, everything is, is using compliant eggs. And we're 90% of the way there with shampoo manufacturers. So they've really gone all the way to exclude non-compliant eggs. So the question is, what's going to happen January 2013 uh, when uh, gestation stalls are banned across the whole of Europe, because the story is similar. There are only three member states which are already 100% compliant, uh, UK and Sweden, because um, we had national legislation dating many years. Uh, Luxembourg, uh, there aren't many sows in Luxembourg, to be honest. Um, many of the others say they will be 100% compliant by January 2013. I've, we have our doubts, because building these buildings takes quite a lot of time. And there's an awful lot of people with an awful lot to do uh, to comply. But nevertheless, they say they will be there. And that would include a lot of the major, company, uh, major countries. Uh, Denmark and Netherlands are well on the way to uh, being compliant. But Germany is taking a slightly different approach, and they're, stopping, uh, they're not producing uh, piglets anymore. 
So what's happening in Germany is they're switching all their farms to finishing only, and they're buying their piglets from Denmark and Netherlands. So they're complying that way, which is which makes perfect sense to me, since in Germany that's where a lot of the major, major abattoirs are, um, and so there's a bit there's a shift in 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 the structure of production within Europe. Um, and then you can see there's a league table of uh, other countries uh, as to how compliant they are going to be by January 2013. We don't know, we don't officially know which country is which uh, in that list of, of who, who isn't going to be compliant. But there are going to be some major pig producing countries, Spain, France, Italy, Poland, uh, which aren't going to be compliant by January 2013. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen to the market? Uh, and what's going to happen after that? These are the questions with, which, uh, uh, which we're asking ourselves in the UK, obviously. Uh, I, I have to say, in the UK, we want this ban to be enforced really, really hard. Because, of course, we're compliant already, and we quite like a 60% price rise at the farm gate for pigs. We don't really want it to be that extreme, but it'd be quite nice to have a little bit. We've done, uh, BPEX uh, economists have done some predictions. I think economists like doing predictions, don't they? Because, of course, it just means they can, it, other people call it telling stories, I think. But um, this is what they tell us. They predict that if the EU moderately enforced the ban, and by that I mean they keep telling the EU member states that the ban has to be implemented, but they don't actually go quickly to the point of fining member states or prosecuting anybody. We still think that the price at Farmgate will go up by at least 10% in early 2013, and that in the course of 2013, production will be down by about 5% on last year. 5% is huge. There's an awful lot of pigs in the EU, and a 5% reduction in production would be enormous. Uh, but uh, under that regime, where the, where the enforcement is fairly moderate, we think that the herd would recover, uh, output would recover inside three years, a combination of uh, some sows coming back into the market and a combina and uh, productivity improvement, we think the total production in the EU would recover inside three years. At which point, uh, it's been a shock to the market, but not something which has decimated the market like happened to the UK in 1990. If they're really strict about it, and with eggs, they have been really strict really quickly, there were um, EU member states being fined by the end of January for not being compliant with the cage ban for eggs. But so one month in, countries are being fined. That's really, really fast by any standards. If that happens, uh, then uh, we would expect production to go down much, much faster uh, in the course of 2013, but still see a strong recovery in the northwest of Europe at least. And by that I mean UK, Netherlands, Denmark, Belgium. Uh, France is in northwest Europe, but uh, France is more difficult to predict. Uh, they seem to be a long way back on their compliance at the moment. If one thing we're concerning ourselves about is if enforcement is strict and if production goes down really, really fast, one consequence of that could be uh, the prospect of third country access to the, U to the EU market for pork. So all you uh, exporters or potential exporters might want to prick your ears up at that one and think that there could be the possibility of significant volumes of uh, US, uh, North South American port coming into the EU to fill the gap. It could happen. Um, what our economists really think is going to happen is that there will be a major, that this will actually have a, uh, that, 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 that uh, productivity may recover, but the structure of the industry in the EU will change significantly because of this. What you'll get actually, ironically, for legislation which is supposed to um, improve animal welfare and we know what activists think about large commercial farming organizations when it comes to animal welfare, this could lead to actually industrialization, further industrialization of production in, in, in the EU, that there will be large integrators with sows in Denmark and Netherlands, finishing facilities in Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, slaughter facilities in those countries, and further processing, wherever that may be, back in local markets. Um, and the net result of that could be that the EU pig industry becomes more like the North American pig industry, more industrialized, more integrated, more efficient, with lower prices uh, 
uh, and greater competitive on world markets. It could happen like that, which would be ironic. It's not just about stalls. It's about space for sows. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this really quickly, and, and I'll pick up with anyone who wants the data. Uh, I, can, I can show you the data later. Um, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on manipulable materials, if you know what those are. Um, but the space allowances for pigs, that's what's going to be the law from January the 13th. Just over 24 square foot feet per sow will be the legal minimum. And that's unencumbered space, which means it's space that the animal may turn around in. Which means that the free access stall, if you have a stall to which the sow has free access, may not count as unencumbered space. Because while she's in the stall, even though she can back out, while she's in the stall, she can't turn around. So that space may not count. I think it probably will, but uh, there's certainly some pressure on it. There you are, slats. This is causing a real nightmare in Europe at the moment because what we've realized is that the maximum slot width, for example, for finishing slats, for pigs, uh, slats for finishing pigs, the maximum slot width is 18 millimeters. And if you measure the slats, and someone's done this, if you go around Europe and measure the, the slot widths, they range between 17 and 21. Because although they're manufactured to an 18 or 19 millimeter specification, the actual, you can imagine, the actual manufacturing tolerance is much wider than that. So quite how that's going to be enforced and whether, whether tolerance will be permitted or not uh, is, is uh, a moot point at the moment. At the moment, we've got animal activists, an activists saying, look, 18 mil maximum, that means an 18 mil maximum, that means all your slats have got to be ripped out, which would be absurd, of course. Manipulable materials, what campaigners, what animal activists really mean, and it's not just animal activists, it's, it's other people involved in, in caring for animals, what they mean is bedding. What they mean by that is straw. So what they, what they really want is straw to be used for all classes of pigs at all times. It's all classes of pigs, not just sows, but uh, nursery, finisher pigs as well. Um, of course, anyone with a slatted system, a slurry system, knows that that's impossible. And that's how most pigs are kept across most of Europe. The UK is fairly unique in how much straw we use. Uh, what's happened so far, that's been in the law for quite some time, that manipulable materials, I, I really struggle with that, manipulable materials have to be available to all pigs at all times. What's happened is there's been a tacit, tacit acceptance by industry auditors and vets that that is just not deliverable and it can't be done. And so manipulable materials has been widened to include uh, toys, plastic balls, uh, chains, pieces of material hanging from chains, um, etc., etc. But it's getting harder and harder to get that past the uh, auditors and the uh, legal framework that backs up that audit program. And I think, and I would say to you, beware of this. Beware of manipulable materials because that could be really, really serious and really, really expensive. Uh, and we're scared of it. I'm going to gloss over this, but uh, there, are, there are more regulations on transport coming into place which may conspire against what I just described of an industrialization of piglets produced in one part of Europe and finished in another. But transport regulations will change, and it'll, it'll be mainly to do with journey times being limited even further than they are already. Castration is an interesting subject in Europe at the moment, and it's one where I would say the market is overtaking, the market is certainly overtaking legislation. In the UK, we don't castrate, we haven't done, we haven't castrated for uh, 30 years. We slaughter at about 250 pounds live weight. I hope I've got that conversion right. It's, uh, about 85 kilos dead weight. So I think that's about 250 pounds live. Um, we don't castrate and we don't feel the need to. Everybody else does and, in, and indeed in Germany you have to. You have to castrate by law. You can't slaughter a, pig in Germany, a male pig in Germany unless it's been castrated. And yet it's in Germany where the market is moving fastest. There's an EU program of uh, consultation which suggests that castration will be um, will be stopped across the EU by about 2018. 
But in Germany, it's going to happen sooner than that, and it's been led by, it's been led by the market. Now, I'm going to warn you to be careful about this next slide. Um, I hope you can see it. This was an advert. This was an advert taken out in mainstream German consumer magazines by an organisation uh, campaigning for the ending of castration. And you can, I think it's fairly obvious what it says. You <laughs> see how you'd like it is the message. Uh, being castrated without anaesthetic. It's pretty dramatic advertising, but it was uh, a well-funded campaign uh, by, uh, as I say, across a lot of media, and it has gained traction. So that what's happening is that the market is taking over, and it's, it's retailers and manufacturers who are saying, okay, you're, you guys are going to have to stop castrating sooner than any law uh, says so. And it will happen. What happens to slaughter weights and what happens to the use of Improvac or any products like that, I don't really know. Um, uh, but it, it, it will change, and it has been led by the market rather than by legislation. Whether the market's been led by activists or whether the market has just moved anyway is, is the bit I'm less certain about. It doesn't really matter whether it's market-led or an activist victory. It's happening, and the winners will be uh, those who get with the program the quickest and make the change quickest. We had a rough time in February and, in fact, in the last couple of weeks in the UK. Then we had a new activist group called Animal Equality, uh, which came out of Spain, which uh, English people are notoriously rude about the Spaniards' attitude to animal welfare on the grounds that if they allow bullfighting, what, are they, what, are they, what can they tell us about animal welfare? We've got the RSPCA. Well, they can tell us a little bit about animal welfare, it would appear from this case study. Um, what they did was uh, they filmed over the... They were employed... There was a guy who was employed on this farm over the course of three months. And then six months later, he produced his film, which he, uh, which he placed with a newspaper. Uh, the RSPCA are really angry about this, and they're looking to prosecute this guy. The RSPCA's recommendations are, if you see an animal being mistreated, stop it happening. If you can't stop it happening, tell your boss. If your boss doesn't stop it happening, ring the RSPCA. And that should happen in the space of a couple of days, not nine months. So if they can catch him, they are looking to prosecute him. Whether that actually goes through or not, I don't know, but that's what they say. On the other hand, it's not really a defense. There was, uh, the reality was there was some terrible, terrible stuff in this footage. Really, really bad. If any of you want to look it up, an, um, animal equality, if you want to Google that, you'll find it, and you'll find the footage still up on their website. But I warn you, it's, it's dreadful, and it's completely indefensible. There's some stuff in there which you say, well, it looks bad, but it's perfectly normal. There's some other stuff in there where you say, well, that is what, it, uh, for example, uh, in dispatching a baby piglet, if you have to kill that, we do it in the way recommended by our Humane Slaughter Association, but it looks terrible. But in amongst all of it, there is some stuff which is just indefensible, and that's caused us some real anxiety in the UK. The upshot of it was, it came in the newspaper on Sunday, and on Tuesday the farmer took his own life, which uh, had the small benefit of removing the story from the newspapers because they didn't want to be associated with that kind of moral conflict. Um, but it's caused some real anxiety uh, within the industry, because what do, we, what do we do about that? He took his own life because he felt isolated. He felt isolated. Was that our fault, because we hadn't gone to his support quickly enough? Was that the industry's fault for not supporting him quickly enough? But if we had supported him, unquestioningly, before we knew what the facts were, would that have been the right thing to do if his farm had been a badly run farm? Uh, some, some real difficulties for us to know quite what to do and quite how to handle it. Um, and of course, we don't want to go in and uh, change our assurance program and change our auditing program and change our inspection program and just load more cost onto production on the basis of one, one bad experience. So the same sort of questions which I'm sure many of you are asking yourselves, um, but, but it's causing us some real anxiety. And one thing, one thing which we've experienced is, is also is trade exclusion. 
This, the idea that, of course, this, the, the news hits the press, the retailer rings the packer and says, tell me I'm not getting product from that farm, and I don't ever want product from that farm, ever again. And then the farm, or even the, the network of farms owned by the same people, could be excluded from trade um, for a long time. And in fact, there, there is evidence of a farm which had a similar story um, published last September, I think it was September last year, published in a Sunday newspaper, inspected by the ARSPCA on the Monday, given the green light, everything is actually fine here, and the farm is still excluded from trade and is having to close down because it's been easier for the retailers to do that. I can understand why they would take that attitude, um, but we're working very hard with them to say, look, you have to understand the consequences of doing that, and you really don't want to get into it, and they are listening. How am I doing? There's, um, there's lots more. It's not just sow stalls or activists filming undercover. There's loads more. Tail reduction is technically illegal in Europe. We all do it because we've all got letters on file from our vets telling us we have to. Um, teeth reduction is illegal in Europe. No, many producers have letters on their file from their vet telling them they have to do it on the grounds of, uh, on the grounds of uh, animal welfare. Many people have stopped teeth clipping or grinding already, and that's happening. That's actually being phased out more or less bit by bit. As, as each producer gets the courage to do it, they're stopping it and finding they can manage the piece quite well without teeth reduction. Tail reduction is another matter. Farrowing crates are under pressure and will always be under pressure. The particular problem in the UK that that causes is it encourages, because we have 45% uh, of the sows in the UK farrow outdoors. That's a feature of our market. It's because it's never hot, never cold in the UK, although some of you who've been there on a rainy day in the winter might argue otherwise. But it's never very cold, and it's never very hot. It rains most of the year round, and it's never, uh, well, <laughs> it's never too wet, never too dry. But at the moment, we have a drought in the UK. It's the wettest drought on record at the moment, because <laughs> um, we have floods and a drought at the same time, which is, uh, which is something we're very proud of. I don't think it's been achieved uh, anywhere else. Um, now, just that last one, welfare outcomes. I want to finish on that if I've got time. This welfare outcomes is a, is, I don't know if that's a phrase that is, that it, that is used over here at all, but it, it should be self-evident what it means. This started off as a UK research initiative um, at Bristol University in England. A, a team of uh, animal welfare researchers started on this and uh, hooked up with the Royal Vet College in London uh, to work with them on it. BPEX got involved on the grounds that uh, we were very reluctant to get involved. I, for one, stood up and said, don't touch this. This is terrible. Um, I was wrong. Uh, but we started off reluctantly. We started off on the principle of keep your friends close and your enemies closer, so we'll work with these people on this project. And actually, you know, it's, it's, it's good. It's good. There's some good stuff coming out of it. And I'll, I'll describe a little bit of it in a moment. Um, it reached the EU agenda, and they've, they're spending 17 million euros, which I think is about 22 million dollars, on uh, looking into this, uh, on looking into measuring welfare outcomes as a, as a way of uh, assessing animal welfare on farms. That's an awful lot of money. I don't think it's going very far because it'll probably take 10 years before they produce their report, uh, and the market will have moved on by then. But nevertheless. Uh, and it's currently starting to be implemented in the UK. There's a program which we BPEX is beginning to implement in the UK. So it's, it's based, and you'll be very familiar with this principle, good welfare is achievable whatever housing type is used. That's the principle which I know you are putting forward uh, as, um, as part of the argument against any ban on um, close confinement gestation stores. And I don't know, can you tell which is the happy group of pigs there? They, look, they both look pretty good to me. Um, the, the picture on the top right is a pig farmed outdoors. It is a live pig, and it's perfectly happy, but it'd be quite difficult to assess whether its welfare is good or not because it's just bathed, bathed in mud. That was just uh, an example that things aren't always as easy to measure as you might imagine. But these, these are the, this is what we're measuring. So how many pigs are kept in hospital pens and, and, and what happens to them? 
What's the incidence of lameness with sows? Uh, what proportion of the sows have a body score, body condition score of less than two? And then what we're getting heavily into, body marks, fight lesions, tail lesions, vulva lesions in sows, uh, as a measure of what is actually happening on the farm when it comes to uh, animal welfare. This is the kind of thing we're producing. I hope you can see that. So uh, on, just take the bottom one as an example. Each dot on that graph is a farm that has been where the incidence of lameness in pigs has been measured as a proportion, as a percentage of the total. And the definition of lameness is written down and all the vets doing the measurement. This is measurement done by vets. All the, all the, they've been trained in exactly what constitutes a lame finishing pig. And what happens, what's been interesting, is what happens is um, when you show a farmer that graph and you say, listen, guy, you're the one up at 5% lameness in finishes. You're the outlier. It's unbelievable the reaction that that farmer has because he doesn't want to be the outlier amongst his peers. We all know we don't want to be told by others how to look after our animals, but we don't want to be an outlier relative to our peers. And so if there's a, if there's a validated measurement system which shows that I'm worse than my neighbours, then I'm going to do something about it. And what happened is, even while this was, un even this was, was under development, this programme, farmers started doing things and started going back to their vets and say, measure me again. Measure me again, because I've done something about it. And that's, what's, that's what I would hope, if you take nothing else out of this, take that out as a positive idea, that if you, if you measure something uh, scientifically, and then if you show how a farmer is performing relative to his peers, and if, if, if he or she is, is an outlier, then something will happen to improve, uh, uh, to improve the result. And if you believe in the system, that means something will have happened to improve the welfare of animals on that farm. Tail biting, similar. We, we're producing similar graphs. Um, I won't bore you with what's the definition of a tail lesion, but it's written down. There's a piece of text which defines what it is in terms of how many millimetres long it would be before it qualifies as a lesion. Uh, but, but this is having the same effect. So this programme has been rolled out... Uh, being rolled out um, across several hundred farms in the UK at the moment just to test the system. Um, one, of the in, in, one of the issues is how long does it take the vet to do, make the measurements and who's going to pay for it? Of course. Uh, the answer is the farmer's going to pay for it. Um, uh, but, but there is obviously a big question of how long it takes. But it is being rolled out and it is, it is successful. It, it, and it's gained... It's gaining a lot of enthusiastic... The, the, the reception by pig farmers in the UK is... Uh, I was going to say enthusiastic, and I've spoiled it, because it's not really quite that good, but it's more than grudging. Farmers are accepting it in a better-than-grudging way, and, and I think that's a positive thing. So those are things I've covered, I hope, in some degree, perhaps not exhaustively, but I've talked about some of the legislative uh, issues in, the, in Europe at the moment. Um, uh, I bitched about how we're suffering from activists in the UK. Uh, I've described, I hope, how the market is leading change, particularly when it comes to castration. And I'm quite proud of the fact that in the UK the industry is taking hold of this and trying to come up with, trying to come up with a system which can show to the world uh, that we take this seriously and we're doing something about it.